the advantage of going second is Derek's covered pretty much most of what I was going to say. <laughs> but uh, the advantage is I can still sort of do a repeat and then Derek, you can tell me if that was good. Um, so before we get into the details, I wanted to show you a teaser, uh, a teaser trailer of what 5G is about to unleash. So that's the question I was asked, which is why I had to do a video, you know, <laughs> couldn't explain it in words. But anyway, so uh, the numbers that you saw on that video, there's not going to be any test, so you can relax. But you know, I'm going to highlight some of them so that you understand the impact and the opportunity that lies ahead. I mean, we have worked a lot with our global clients and tried to understand the impact they're going to have as they start rolling out 5G. Um, and I showed you some numbers, but half a trillion of GDP increase in a US economy is quite a phenomenal number when you think of it just attributed to one technology. I mean, and the jobs that you saw there, I mean, 3% increase in jobs across the US economy is quite a fundamental shift from where they are today to where they want to be. And pretty much if you aggregate all of the big operators in North America and look at the total spend they're doing in the economy, that's in the region of $270 billion, which basically means over the next seven years, they're going to put something like 30 to 40 billion dollars just as infrastructure spent. Um, so if you look at all of this, then clearly it is a revolution because we haven't seen that kind of uh, benefits to the society, to the industry, and to Derek's point, beyond consumers, it's the adjacent industries that are seeing the promise of, of 5G. Now at the technology level, just a little bit of why is it that this is of so much interest and it's creating so much promise for, for uh, industries globally is because of the three attributes that uh, Derek mentioned. And we use the word currencies for those attributes. And basically, they are speed, scale, and latency. And why we call them currencies is because for the first time, we actually see a monetary value associated with each of those attributes. I mean, in the past, when we rolled out 3G, 4G networks, and so on, we always had the primary audience being wireless consumers, and we were going to roll out data plans. And the only measure of success was how fast could you consume data and how much data could you consume. That was our acid test of how successful we were. And now suddenly, we have these three currencies to deal with. I mean, Derek mentioned some numbers. Our research corroborates those numbers. Just on latency, if you get something down to less than 10 milliseconds, that's a phenomenal leap of technology, right? I mean, that will really enable things that you couldn't even do with wireless technology before. I mean, Laura talked at the very beginning of what would happen in a game scenario. And previously, if you wanted to like experience a game and it only comes to you 10 seconds later, that's not really experiencing a game. You know, then you might as well watch highlights. 
but now you can actually see the game happening in real time which is which is quite a big leap and that's why we say it's a currency and then even on scale the research we've done shows 100x number of devices are going to be existing that support 5g and i use the word devices because as derek said it's not handsets handsets are actually less than 10% of that 100x increase they are actually wearables sensors lots of things that are not handsets are going to be enabled with 5G. And then speed is obvious. Uh, we did some tests for our clients and you know any movie that you download in ultra 4K HD today on the fastest 4G network will still take you minutes. With 5G it will take you three and a half seconds. So that's when you think about those numbers now you start to understand what are the opportunities that, that 5G is actually going to uh, highlight. Now I'm going to go through this and really add a little bit more color to what Derek already described. But those are the three currencies that I showed you. Now of course there is some technology terms in there so you don't need to get worried. Speed scale latency translates to you know having ultra low latency services, having enhanced mobile broadband which is very high speed broadband and then massive internet of things which is that 100x devices that I mentioned. And the use cases that we see getting implemented, I mean, South Korea was shown there in the video, right? And you probably have seen the news release. They launched their 5G service a few months ago, and then they launched the, the full spectrum of data plans based on 5G two months ago. And within two months, they've seen a million subscribers signing up to that service. Two months for a million subscribers. I mean, if you look at the take up of previous generations of technology, that's an order of magnitude more, just in South Korea. Right. So, the reason these, these services are being taken up at that rate is because of all these other things that they enable. So, if I just stay on latency, Derek mentioned the point of having ultra low latency services and the partnerships that we are doing around virtual reality, augmented reality and extended reality to your point. Because enabling this would simply not be possible without 5G. Um, doesn't mean to say, by the way, that these use cases like connected vehicles and the remote robotics that Derek mentioned are mutually exclusive. They are actually going to need all three currencies, but we just outlined them that way because we know that some of these are going to major on latency. So if you look at enhanced mobile broadband, and there was quite a lot of hype in the North American market when they started launching fixed wireless access, we were actually involved deeply in that. And the question always was, hey, how come Fikes Wireless Access is not being rolled out everywhere then, if it's such a big thing? And the answer is kind of obvious, which is to actually give you a gig of bandwidth at home, you can, of course, roll out 5G, but then your physical infrastructure, the non-mobile infrastructure, the fiber and the copper, and the rest of your network have to support one gig. And for that to happen, the economics will not work in the way we run business today. Which is why Derek's point of these enablers would actually get monetized if industries pick them up. So if I had high speed broadband going into a machinery plant or a mine, then I can load up some of the remote robotics on top and put ultra low latency applications on top. Then I can actually monetize those things. Just giving one gig of speeds to households will not monetize all the benefits of 5G. And then even on the massive internet of things, if you look at sensor networks, which is what uh, was highlighted before, and I showed you in my video, we are doing some tests with uh, crime prevention agencies right now. And what they're doing is something very interesting. They are using sensors to detect heat signatures that actually happen if somebody has got a weapon or if they are doing something dangerous in, in a public place. Those sensors pick it up and crime prevention agencies can then have variables that flag to them that there is an incident likely to happen. Doesn't mean it's actually happened, but you are actually preventing that. Those kind of things would not be possible because if you had to roll out hundreds and thousands of sensors in a public event for security, that would be cost prohibitive previously. Which is why you will look uh, along this trajectory and you will see that the sensors network will ultimately enable smart cities, smart spaces, drones, and so on and so forth, right? So, that's just giving you a little bit of a view of what are the opportunities that 5G gives. Now, the obvious question is, hey, how come all of this is not rolled out already, right? Clearly, there are some challenges. And that's what I'm going to sort of highlight now. 
we've sort of looked at six challenges and, and, and I always finish with this slide because um, the work that we do with our clients shows that deploying those use cases I showed you in the previous slide is not trivial. There is a huge amount of work to be done and there are a few challenges that we have to overcome. So spectrum availability, to give you these high speeds and these ultra low latencies and scale, somebody has to free up the spectrum that operators can actually consume and then offer you as services. Now what spectrum would you choose depends on the use cases that you want to deploy. You can't just go around and buy as much spectrum as you want. Ideally you could, but capital constraints mean you cannot. And so most operators, even the largest ones in the US that we work with have said, if I'm looking for fixed wireless access, that means I need millimeter wave frequency. I don't need everything else. And I'm only going to focus on that. Whether that's right or wrong, we don't know. But spectrum availability and how we go about addressing that is a key challenge. Alongside that, we have what Derek mentioned before, which is use case and business models. We really have to, in this case, understand what is the overall economics of deploying a particular application. There is no point just rolling out the network and expecting these use cases to get monetized. It will be cost prohibitive. So that, again, is the biggest challenge we see. And then devices. Right now, only two or three manufacturers have handsets that support 5G. So what do we do? Do we wait? Do we do something else? What about sensors? What about chipsets? What about other devices that go in machineries and plants? They are coming up all the time. So you can't wait for handsets to come up with 5G. So devices, again, are a very major part of how do you address the challenge and how do you enable the devices. Architectural innovation, and of course, this is a short talk, so I'm not going to get into adaptive beamforming and massive MIMO and network slicing and edge compute, but let me just say that all of those things have to be done in the background for you to even roll out this network and make it a reality. This is hard engineering work uh, that pretty much all operators in the ecosystem are currently undergoing. And then deployment, as I made the point, it's not understood widely that you can't actually have a 5G network unless you have a very high speed broadband network in the back. You need a fixed line network of fiber to actually support and consume all of these services, which is very capital intensive. So deploying that is also a challenge that we are addressing as a community. And then the operational complexity. So, you know, we will roll out 5G in 10 cities, 20 cities, then 40 cities. We will roll it out in stadiums, in hospitals, in machineries, in plants. How will you operate this network? Who will the plant manager call when there is a problem with this network? How will you actually manage this? Right now, it's a very predictable management layer that we have built because we have experience with mobile services today. 2G, 3G, 4G gives us the experience to have a predictable operational experience. We have no prior experience in this case. So if you have 10,000 sensors in a plant and something starts going wrong, how do you fix it? What's your mean time to repair? So there's an enormous amount of operational complexity that also needs to be solved, which is why I fully resonate with what Derek concluded with, which is for all of this to be solved, it's an ecosystem play. I, I look at the gaming analogy and, you know, as Alan said, you know, when I was seven or eight, I used to go to these gaming arcades and put pennies in there and play and then come home and feel, wow, that was a wonderful game. And I was super excited when I got Mario at home because I had a joystick and a console. But the gaming industry became really successful because of three reasons. One was ecosystem, because the console manufacturers heavily subsidized the infrastructure, which in their case was consoles and handsets, that allowed games to come in and get consumed very quickly. And then they made the revenue on the, on the games. And of course, all of us enjoyed that. For 5G to succeed, the burden cannot just be on operators. Because if operators rolled out the infrastructure and the value is elsewhere, that's never going to happen. So for this economics to work, chipset manufacturers, cities, governments, communities, operators, device manufacturers, there's a much bigger ecosystem that has to participate and understand the impact. So, I mean, if I was to summarize this question, which is, is 5G an evolution and an evolution? Well, absolutely, it's a revolution. For us to actually get there, we really need to think of it as an ecosystem play. If we don't, it will default to an evolution. So, that's, that's why I believe, my prediction is, it is here, it is going to change the world. 
the bigger question we have to ask is are we ready for it that's it from me thank you sara thank you